This video is all about procedural textures, which is creating and modifying textures from code. And procedural textures are used lots of places. They're used for adding detail to objects, they're used for various types of special effects, and they're used for responding to user input. The first thing we need to understand is how textures are organized in memory in Unity. Typically, when we think of textures, we think of things like PNGs and JPEGs. And these are highly compressed formats that you really can't use directly for games. JPEGs and PNGs can't be sent to a GPU for rendering, and they also can't be easily edited in memory. So when we're working on textures procedurally in Unity, we're going to represent that texture as a series of pixels. And those pixels are going to have red, green, blue, and alpha channels. And the textures themselves are going to have different properties. They may have mipmaps applied, or they may use different types of compression that works on the GPU. For that reason, one thing to be aware of is that editable textures, procedural textures in memory, are going to be a lot larger than the equivalent JPEG or PNG on disk. And if you're working with a lot of textures procedurally, you can run into issues where you start using a lot of memory on the CPU. In Unity, there are two major ways to read and write textures. You can either use the pixel methods, or you can use the raw texture data methods. Let's start with the pixel methods. In this case, we get and we set individual pixels or arrays of pixels in our image. And each pixel is a struct, and that struct, again, has a red, green, blue, and alpha channel, which you can set from code. There are two different ways to think about these channels. We can think of them as values from 0 to 1. So for instance, 0 in the red channel means no red, and 1 in the red channel means fully red. Or we can think of these as bytes, values from 0 to 255. And Unity allows us to work in either way that we choose. We can work in this 0 to 1 paradigm, or we can directly set the bytes. The way that the texture is referenced in memory is by bytes. So if you can work in bytes, that will always be faster. If you want to work in floats, Unity will convert them to bytes when it sets the texture. But working in floats can be easier. That's how we're more used to thinking about color values. From there, you can either get and set individual pixels, or you can do arrays of pixels. Uh, when you work with individual pixels, what you get back is a single struct, and this tends to be the slowest way to modify textures. On the other hand, if we get the texture data as an array, what we're essentially doing is we're taking a 2D texture, so a texture that has an X and a Y number of pixels, and we're turning that into a 1D array of pixels. Essentially, we're painting line by line with a single thread of pixels. And working with multiple pixels tends to be much quicker, again, than trying to set individual pixels. So this is the preferred way to do procedural texture generation and modification. The other way that we mentioned earlier to work with textures is by accessing their raw texture data. And when you do this, this is largely similar to our get pixels method of earlier in that we do get a single dimensional array of data. We get the raw memory associated with that texture. The difference here is that we get the full raw texture data, meaning that we have to think about things like mipmaps, for instance, or things like texture compression and formatting. Um, we can't simply set the pixels and let Unity figure out and take care of the structure of the file for us. We do have to understand what we're doing. So this method is a lot faster because we are directly writing to the texture memory, but it's also more dangerous and things can go a lot more wrong if you don't know what you're doing. One other potential downside of working with the native texture memory is that this is considered volatile memory, meaning that it can change over time. So you can't get this texture data, save it in memory, and expect one or two or 10 or 20 seconds later that that data won't have changed. This is something that you need to get from the texture and set immediately before something else overwrites that memory. In either way that we choose to modify our textures, at the end, we need to apply the changes to the texture. And this actually forces Unity to update the representation of the texture on the GPU. So what that means is while you're editing your texture in the CPU, you aren't actually changing how the texture looks in your game. Only when you apply those changes and update the actual rendering of the texture will you see any change. 
And one thing to know is the apply method has significant overhead. We're doing a large operation. So this is something that we don't wanna do often. We wanna do all of our changes and then apply once. And what you'll see with each of these steps is when you're editing textures procedurally, whether it be with, say, get or set pixels, or whether you're working with the raw texture data, there is going to be overhead associated with that. And as you start to get to more textures, or as you start to get to larger textures, that overhead can become significant. So this is something that we want to use sparingly, or we want to really optimize to make sure that we're not slowing down our game. And in working with textures procedurally, a texture is worth a thousand words. So we're going to move over to Unity, and we're actually going to use some of this logic to update a texture and to see how that works. And we're going to stick to the get and set pixel methods for now, rather than working directly with the texture data. And what I have here is a pretty basic script to start procedurally modifying textures. What we have is a texture defined, and we're actually creating the texture via code. So this one is simply 32 by 32 pixels, and we've set a couple of the high-level texture settings. We're going to add some code, and then we're going to use a very old Unity method called onGUI, which is part of Unity's uh, immediate mode GUI system. And we're simply going to draw our texture over the entirety of the screen. So if I flip back over into the editor and I hit play, then we'll see that we have a texture over the entirety of the screen and it's just one solid color. So we haven't done anything interesting yet. Flipping back over to our code, as we mentioned earlier, the first thing we need to do is figure out how we're going to represent this image in memory. And we have two options. We're going to do a uh, collection of pixels, but we can either do those as bytes or we can do those as floats. And here I'm gonna choose floats because it makes my life easier. So we are going to create a color array. Color 32, by the way, is bytes and color is floats. And this is going to be an array. And these are going to be, we'll call these our pixels. And the length of this is going to be uh, a color array of size 32 times 32. Because again, we're stretching out this square texture into an array. And then we simply need to define a loop, which I've done here. And we can go through and we can set the values pixel by pixel. So just to add a quick line of code, for each pixel, I'm going through and I am creating a new color. And I'm setting the red value to a value between 0 and 1. The first pixel will be 0, and the last pixel will be 1. Um, so this will simply go from um, black to red, since we're not changing the green or the blue values. And as I mentioned before, we haven't done anything yet. We need to do two steps with this array. The first thing we need to do is call that setPixels value on our texture. So from our texture, we are going to call setPixels. We're going to pass in our pixels. And then the last thing we always need to do is to apply. And this is what actually sends it to the GPU so that it can be rendered. So now if we flip back over to Unity and hit play, then we can see that we have generated a texture that goes from black to red. And this also shows us the direction. So in Unity, when you um, edit the pixels of textures, it always starts in the bottom left and it goes line by line up the image, as we showed earlier in the video. So let's do something slightly more interesting. I've now modified our color so that we're changing the green value. And I'm using the modulo operator. So our green value, as we go through pixel by pixel, um, this will go from 1 to 32, and then it will loop back. So a value of 33 will loop back to 1, and it'll keep going through. And then we're going to divide that by 32. And what that's going to do, we're using the length of our texture. So basically, our green value is going to be 0 on the left, and it's going to be 1 on the right. And our red value is going to be 0 in the bottom left corner and 1 in the top right corner. And if we pop back over to Unity and we hit play, then we're going to see that that generates a nice gradient texture, like the old Final Fantasy games. Another thing I want to show you is how you can modify existing textures instead of creating them from scratch. So we're going to get rid of our first couple lines of code here. And to get the pixels of our texture, we're actually going to read from an existing texture. This is going to be set in the inspector. So we're going to take our texture and we're going to use get pixels. And this needs to match the format that we're using. So in this case, um, I want to return a color array, an array of floats, rather than a color 32 array. So this is the correct method. 
And when I call that, I can then do interesting things. So for instance, instead of directly setting the color, we can modify the color. Perhaps we want to invert the color. And the way that we would do that is to simply take our existing color for each pixel, so say the ith pixel's red value, and we are going to subtract that from one. And then we'll go through and we'll define that for the green and the blue as well. Then lo and behold, we'll see an inverted version of our apple. And we see this strange banding around the edges. What happened here is our apple previously had transparency, but now it does not, because in our code we did not preserve that alpha value. So to fix that, we would have to go through and take the previous pixel value alpha and set that to the texture. But we have another issue here, and if I get out of play mode in Unity, what we see is this apple here continues to be inverted, even outside of play mode. Um, and what's happened here is we've actually edited this texture. We edited it from code. So this was not just a thing that happens when you hit play and get sandboxed like so much of Unity. You're actually editing the underlying asset here. However, you're editing the asset only in Unity. So if I were to look at this on disk, I would see that the value on disk has not changed. Unity has not overridden this texture. The only thing that's changed is the imported version. So we know that when we import something into Unity, we go through all of these options and we save that into Unity's library. We create an imported version of that texture. That's what I've modified. But if I were to go to my Apple and I were to choose to re-import, it would throw all that away and pull the value from disk again. So this is just something to be aware of, that you are actually working with assets when you use this type of procedural code. And just to hit play one more time, now that we've fixed that issue with the alpha, then we'll see that we have our nice inverted apple without that weird banding because we have not changed the alpha values. So transparent pixels are properly transparent as they should be. And those are the basics of working with textures procedurally or from code. We need to be able to represent our texture as a data object. We need to be able to use Unity's internal libraries to read and write to the pixels of the texture. And we need to apply that so that it goes back to the GPU.